Greetings to each of you in Jesus' name, especially for those who have joined us for the very first time this morning. Welcome and greetings again in Jesus' name. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? Um, the title for this morning's message is Faith Honors and Pleases God. If you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I'll just read the first part of the verse. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We live in a world where people want to please people. God is not given the first place, even in a church or in a Christian community. But God says, faith honors God and God honors faith. If you look at the Bible, there are so many things that can please God. But he has specifically said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. As I just said, that we like to please men and try to become more pleasers of men rather than pleasers of God. Several years ago, in an American Assemblies of God church that I attended, the pastor asked me to take the offering and after I took the offering, he'd asked me to count the offering along with another believer, another brother of ours. And when I counted the offering, I got hold of an envelope. And I counted the cash in the envelope with no name on it. And it was $2,000 in cash. I was really surprised that there was no name on this envelope. It taught me a lot. But just look, back, look at it. The pastor did not know it. The congregation did not know it. But he just wanted to please God. That really touched me. But we as Christians and we as a community have done so many things that sometimes displeases God and pleases men. We print the names of all donors in the songbook. We list them in public and call the highest name of the greatest donor of that church or the conference. We invite people saying this is the first check for this conference. But are we reading a different Bible? Or are we trying to just please men and not God? Because when Jesus looked at that woman casting two mites into that, she said he was, she was the one who gave the most. But there were many more people who gave much more. But what we look at is the highest, the greatest amount. Why? We like to please men. Maybe we may not get a stage again, or we may not get an opportunity again, so we become men pleasers in this world. That's just one example. In the Bible we see that King Herod decided to king, kill James. When James was killed, the Bible says he found that the, it pleased the Jews and immediately wanted to kill Peter too. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. The Bible tells it very clearly. Pilate wanted to please the crowd and please people. And therefore, he let Jesus be crucified. But the Bible says Enoch pleased God. Enoch was born. After 65 years of his life, his son Methuselah was born. The Bible says Enoch walked with God for 300 years and he was taken up. And I was just thinking about that, tried to read about it. The Bible says that after Methuselah was born, he walked with God for 300 years. But what about the first 65 years of his life? Bible scholars believe that he had a revelation. And he named Methuselah because it meant he is dead. And now it cometh. Meaning that after the death would come the flood. God had revealed it to him that there would be the flood coming up. That's what the Bible scholars tell about Hino. We do not read much about it. But it clearly says he was a godly man in a generation with no godly people around him. But yet, he walked with God. Amen. And in the book of Jude, he says he prophesied about the second coming of Christ. Amen. 
very clearly in evidence that says that he walked with God, a godly man. And the Bible says he pleased God. Amen. Well, how? By his faith. If God honors faith and faith honors God, Amen. there's no compromise on it when it comes to faith. Amen. Now, if you look at the book of Mark, chapter 11, Jesus walked along with his disciples and he saw a fig tree without fruits but leaves. And Jesus looked and said, let this tree be cursed. And then Peter later on found this tree withered away and then brought it to the notice of Jesus. Jesus said, have faith in God. Next slide, please. And Jesus went on to say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you need, if you say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and not doubt in his heart, but believe those things, what he saith, it shall come to pass. Amen. Whatsoever things he desire in prayer, when he pray, believe that he shall receive them, and he shall have them. Amen. Now, I'm not going to talk about the mountain mowing faith here, but I'm just going to bring it to your attention. The word, do not doubt in your heart. So faith can kill doubts, and doubts can worry faith too. But we got to have an understanding here that we cannot doubt in our hearts when we walk by faith. Amen. Three men came to Abraham and, and Sarah, visited them, and we know they obviously were angels. Now, they asked Abraham, where is Sarah? And then said, Sarah is going to have a child. A son would be born. Now Sarah was listening to this conversation. And she said, and she laughed within herself. How could I have pleasure at this age and have a child? And she doubted, meaning she laughed within herself. But then they said, is anything too hard for God? Now, this is something that we need to understand. Abraham, a man of faith. Sarah was listed as the woman of faith in the book of Hebrews. But she still had a doubt. That is human. But we cannot let doubt be buried and give room to overcome our faith. We should bury faith in such a way and walk by looking not at what you see around, but looking at the one that has written the word of God. Amen. The one that has given us hope. Zacharias and Elizabeth, godly people, just people. But when the angel appeared to him and said that they're going to have a son, which was John the Baptist, Zacharias doubted. But what did God do? He knew his faith, gave him time. And it worked. And God's divine plan worked. But I'm saying, whether it's Zechariah the great priest, or whether it's Sarah the woman, there was doubts in people. But doubts cannot stop us from getting our promise and getting our blessings from God. See, we got to understand this word of God. See, Jairus went to Jesus and told Jesus, my daughter is ill. Please come and place your hand and pray and she will be healed and she will live. But Jesus never uttered a word. And we know the following passage, it says about the woman with the issue of blood. I'm not going into it. But I'm just telling you that Jesus went on to work with this woman and she received her healing. But then soon after, there cometh a man from the rule from the house of Jairus with the ruler of the synagogue and tells that, Master, do not trouble Jesus because she's already dead. That is the time when Jesus said, be not afraid, only believe. First, first slide, please. Be not afraid, only believe. See, when everything was fine in the beginning and when the child was sick, Jesus never uttered a word. But the moment a negative word came in there, or a, a bad news came, or a sad news came, or something that was shattering, something that said everything is gone, everything is lost now, nothing, there's no more hope. 
at that time Jesus said, be not afraid, only believe. Repeatedly in the Old Testament, if you look at the book of Joshua, in chapter 1, in the very first chapter, God says to Joshua, Moses had died, thousands of Israelites to be led, a promise to be claimed, many kingdoms to be overcome. Here was Joshua. But, G G but God repeatedly said, be strong and of a good courage. And he said that four times. Only one time he said, be not afraid. Be not be afraid. Do not be afraid or dismayed. And then in the following chapters, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 11, you, said, you see God telling Joshua repeatedly, do not fear. Be not fearful. Why? There were not just one king around him. There were kings and kingdoms that they had to overcome. There were groups of kings, a large multitude with great armies coming to attack Israel. But God said, fear not. Fear not, reminding him again, because God had already had, had told him to be strong out of a good courage. Amen. See, God's word is what we need to hold on to. Because there are going to be mountains in our life, and I'm sure everybody knows this. I think everybody, most people can preach on this topic too. It's not very difficult. But a moment you face a mountain, and there are preachers who have said that God is working in such a way, he wants you to change and not the mountain to move. Well, that's not the point here. And uh, it can be happen the other way too. It can happen the other way too. God can move the mountain for you. And God can help you learn the lesson too. But that's not the point here. The point here we need to understand is that God has very clearly said that without faith it is impossible to please Him. But how do we get that faith? How do we walk by faith? How do we overcome just like Sarah did, Abraham did, and the list of the heroes in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go on to the word believe. Jairus was told, believe. And if you look at the sequence of events, his disciples and people around the crowd were not very sure of what's going to happen. Because this 12-year-old was already dead. But Jairus, he took God's word. If you look very carefully and read the passage, he never uttered a single word. I believe that word of God worked in him. And Jesus raised the girl, dead girl and brought her back to life. Who will rejoice more than anybody else and the Father? That is exactly what God wants us to do. Be not afraid, only believe. See, fear, fear can torment us. You know? When we are fearful, there's no point in going into the room and closing your door and saying, hey, what do I do now? The battle is not over. The battle is not over. God wants us to fight the battle. But not with anything else, but with God's word. So repeatedly, let me go back to the last, last point here, please. Go to slide number one. See, faith honors God. Faith honors God. See, Robert Moffat and Mary Moffat, missionaries to Botswana in the 1800s. They went there. Remember, that was a time, it was almost 200 years ago. And even Africa today is not so developed like as we see in other nations. Think of this couple having led of God when they to work for God. Year one went, ten years by. Not a single convert for Jesus. Very disappointed. Very discouraged. Think about their faith. After ten years, they got a message from a friend in England saying, we would like to send you a Christmas present. We would like to send you a gift. What would you like to have? Robert Moffat and Mary Moffat said, please send us a set of communion set. Please send us a communion set. Not a single convert for Jesus. The 11th year passed by, 12th year passed by, and then this gift arrived. But just before the gift arrived, it was so interesting to read what I read. That six tribals, Africans from Botswana, accepted Christ before the communion set came. They didn't know what was to happen. They just by faith said, just send us the communion set. Remember, it's almost 12 years now. God honors faith. 
But what struck me most recently about Botswana was this past week, the second largest diamond in the world was discovered in Botswana. You may think, what is the connection to this? The president of Botswana took the diamonds in his hands and he said, God is good. 70% of Christians today in Botswana is what stats say. 70% of Botswana are Christians today. Remember, with faith, whatever was sowed 200 years ago is still bringing forth harvest in a nation unknown to the world. But God is showing them, it is not least souls. I can also bless you materially. That was a real surprise to me. Nothing goes in vain when you honor God. Whatever you sow, even with just by faith, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly of all they think and ask for. Now what is and more interesting is Robert Buffett's son-in-law was David Livingston. God honored him that way too. A man who took the gospel to Africa again. So we see that over and over again that faith pleases God. There's nothing else that we can compromise on but walk by faith and not by sight. I've, I've experienced it myself so many times, but sometimes I think, why should I share it before the church, thinking, they may, thinking that I might be blowing my trumpet? But God does miracles and wonders, only if you let the mountain move with your faith. But faith can paralyze it. Okay, now let's come to the practical aspect of it. How do we get that faith? And we know faith comes by hearing, hearing the, the word of God. See, that's very easy to memorize, to understand, but to practice isn't easy. The Bible says, hear. So when there is bad news, when you're so discouraged, when it's so disappointing that I cannot step, take one step ahead in life, cannot move one inch ahead, my spiritual life seems to be shattered, what do I do? This, this looks like everything is dead and buried. And I just cannot get up from here. And remember, some people don't share this to others. Why? It's not just an unspoken request. You've got to understand there are instances and times with, that you have gone through or I have gone through or we sometimes go through is sometimes we cannot share it with anybody else. Sometimes you cannot share it with your own family members. What do you do? But you've got to walk by faith and not by sight. See, doubting Thomas, when Jesus appeared to him, what did Jesus tell him? Blessed are those that have not seen but that have believed. So you just don't walk by sight but by faith. So then you see this mountain, you see that you're in such a situation, what do we do? There are many simple things that we can do. You can listen to a testimony. There's no point as sitting on the couch and saying, I'm going to have a nap or take a walk and things will be better. No, it's not going to happen that way. Or I'm going to just go out and hang out with my friends. Or I'm going to call my counselor and see what he could do. The word of God is your greatest counselor. Where else do you want to go? He is the greatest counselor. So listen to a testimony or turn on and try to sit, listen to a message. Cannot God speak to you? Is he dead? He does not sleep nor slumber. That's what the word of God says. Now you and I go into slumber sometimes and sometimes we out of depression some people sleep. But what does the word of God says? That fear should not grip you and paralyze you and let you be just buried in your spiritual life and become a spiritually dead person. No, that's not what God's aim is. That's not what Robert Muffet or his wife Mary Muffet did. Sarah also did not give up. Remember, I was just thinking about that. Like, if Sarah was so doubtful, Sarah was so doubtful, Abraham, the man of God, was there to support him. So maybe it's sometimes a spouse that is so weak in faith. Now the other man or the other husband or the other wife can help and, and encourage. That's what we need to do. And so listen to the word of God. And then what do we else? Believe God's word. If you cannot even read a scripture, open the Bible. Or if you can just read one verse, just read it. It may be just the word. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. Amen. I remember an occasion. It was so shattering that I was falsely accused for something. I was just thinking, what do I do? I have all the evidence to show, but they're not just believing it. That whole night, I remember, I just confessed this word. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. Amen. 
over and over again in my night time, in between my sleep, I kept telling this verse. By God's grace, that morning, I got the email saying, an email of apology to me. Uh, and that person, a few days later, met me and said, I really wanted to apologize to you in person. I was so surprised and so happy. Praise the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. Amen. See, we just hold on to God's word. Just that's what we could do. You know, practically nobody tells everything before a church. But sometimes we do have to because it encourages people. So not only you just read the Bible or hear the word of God, but you just believe it. You just believe it because you just, how do we believe it? You just repeatedly think about the words or meditate on the words or confess the word of God or try to just do whatever you can, read, the, read it aloud. And let the word of God work in you. It's alive. It's alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing center of soul and spirit. So will it not work in you and me? Yes, definitely. And that's what Jesus did. So coming back to the word of God, and then say, act. How do we act? Acting, believing that God is able to do. For you. Because that's what Jairus did. See, when God asked everybody else to get out of the room, People who did not have faith. He just asked them to leave that place. But Jairus was there. He did not doubt. And the disciples who believed in him also was with them. And God worked the miracle. Miracles does not happen instantly. You've got to work for it. You've got to let God move in your heart and life. And the word of God is able. Able. As I said, hear God's word. Believe God's word. And act on God's word. Act on God's word. You know, it's a simple saying. It's something that you have even heard of it. It's nothing great. You've heard this before. That when you pray for rain, what does it say? We just sit down and just say it's going to rain. No. You act by faith, take an umbrella and walk out saying, I, I believe it's going to rain. That's faith. No? It sounds simple. It sounds silly too. But that's called action in faith. And that's what the word of God says that repeatedly God's people did it. Over and over again they did it. Let's, let's go to the last slide please. See, Jesus, as soon as he heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the rule of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. The devil is constantly behind us to shatter our faith. But the word of God, see immediately what Jesus, immediately as he heard the word, he uttered, be not afraid, only believe. Now, for you and me, Jesus is in us, he's around us, and he's with us. But what do we hold on? We don't say, Jesus, come on, do it for me. No, we just hold on to his word. And then act on it, and believe it that he's faithful to do it. Finally, let me conclude. God honors faith. Faith honors God. Without that, it is impossible to believe. So let's not walk by sight, but faith, believing that He is able to do it. People have moved mountains, and literally that has happened. There are many examples to say, but I'm not going to go on. See, if you look at George Muller and the great men of God, see, they didn't ask man for help. That's what we need to understand. Why ask man for help? When you can ask a God who can do it for you. There's no harm in asking people to pray for you. But the thing is, when it comes to certain things, that we should take it to God and not to man. Finally, let me conclude that Enoch walked with God and it pleased God. We have a time on this earth but that only God knows how long. That we can walk with God even in an ungodly world like we live in. Remember, there was nobody around Enoch to support him. We don't read of his wife. We don't read about his family who supported him. But we still, he was a holy man. A man who walked with God. So let's not blame the world, or blame the country, or blame the society, because if God expects us to walk by faith, so that people will see our faith and come to God. God bless you for this words. Amen.